So please, please give a very warm welcome to our speaker tonight, Dr. Mary April. Thanks. Mary, thank you. I really do. It stopped raining. I could see all the rain on the ground, but it stopped raining for me and um, found you without uh, any problem whatsoever. I like small college campuses. It's a neat place. So this talk is called um, Observing the Civil War Centennial, the Rhetoric and the Reality of a Commemoration. And um, um, I remember back to 1664, mainly I remember going to high school um, dances and you know trying to get my act together. And unfortunately, I really didn't have not much of a historical consciousness about what was going on then. Um, but I look back now, now we're 50 years later, and we're in the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. It's a very different kind of commemoration. It's much quieter uh, for some reasons that have to do with the issues and problems that arose when we celebrated or observed the Civil War Centennial. So um, without further ado, we'll get started. Americans of the early Cold War period did see a very usable past as they look forward to the centennial of the Civil War. Um, popularized during the 1950s, and I bet you read either one or both of these guys through the narrative histories of Bruce Catton and Alan Nevins, um, that distant war offered heroic images that could comfort and inspire as at the same time they provide a diversion from a very uneasy present. With citizens' attention fixed on subversive threats, real or imagined, to democratic institutions, the vision of the United States, tested and strengthened in the crucible of civil conflict, offered um, very real reassurance that the nation could meet any challenge and emerge a winner. Uh, such use of the Civil War legacy placed Americans um, at the middle of the 20th century right squarely in the tradition of other generations of commemorators who employed that legacy, or more precisely, a selectively remembered version of it, um, to promote a contemporary agenda. Like the veterans who led the crusade to create the first battlefield parks at the turn of the 20th century, for example, centennial planners found their philosophical base in a celebration of reunion uh, and in the glorification of American military ability and devotion to principle. The need to articulate ideals that could unite Northerners and Southerners while skirting potentially disruptive issues was absolutely essential to the success of both of those commemorative enterprises and that shaped the way in which each one exploited um, our Civil War heritage. Now, battlefield preservationists of the 1890s, and I should just digress a minute to say that the very first National Civil War parks, five of them, were established in the 1890s, um, and the Civil War generation, the veterans themselves, uh, were in a leadership role there. Chickamauga and Antietam in 1890, um, Shiloh in 1893, Gettysburg not till 1894, interestingly, and Vicksburg in 1899. And so these battlefield commemorators, these members of the war generation, um, they appealed to the decade spirit of nationalism, of which Anglo-Saxon racism was an intrinsic element in order to get the bipartisan support that they needed politically and publicly um, to get all that money spent on buying land and establishing national battlefield parks. Latter-day commemorators, though, um, found the road to consensus much tougher during the 1960s. Now, as far as the leadership in centennial planning was concerned. Um, on the national level, uh, the leadership role was taken by the United States Civil War Centennial Commission, whose authorization by Congress itself in 1957 capped a lobbying effort that drew popular support from a network of study groups called Civil War Roundtables, and that drew direction from a small number of civic and professional and political leaders. Those leaders, including professional historians like Bruce Catton, Bell Wiley from Emory University down in Atlanta, and Avery Craven, um, those leaders, this small group of leaders, were conspicuous in the commission as it was first constituted by President Eisenhower. Um, perhaps none more so than the commission chairman himself, this is a very familiar name, Ulysses S. Grant III, who was the grandson was a career soldier himself and the grandson, obviously, of the famous Civil War military leader. With General Grant as the commission chairman and Executive Director Carl Betts, B-E-T-T-S, who was a Baltimore investment broker and the chairman 
of the District of Columbia Civil War Roundtable. With those two gentlemen at the helm, what the National Commission tried to do was keep a handle on the development of ideology. Uh, and then they also promoted decentralization in carrying out the commemoration for both philosophical reasons as well as prudent, uh, financial prudence, uh, fiscal reasons as well. Um, so they urged the creation of state commissions and local commissions, decentralize it and get those states and local communities to spend the money and to actually carry the thing out. Um, so they urged the creation of these small local commissions that would organize activities for their own communities, for American cities and towns. And the aim here was to get the people involved, get as many people involved as you could in observances of local ties to Civil War history, like Waukesha's or Milwaukee's or my, my home community of Mansfield, Ohio, or whatever, um, and American bravery under fire. At any rate, as um, the planning moved ahead, an event that was very carefully symbolic of sectional reconciliation showed the usefulness of history in promoting um, socially or ideologically desirable goals and really prefigured the effort to do that, to use the commemoration in that regard as they moved forward through the early 1960s. This particular occasion was in 1958, and it was the presentation of its gold medal award from the District of Columbia Civil War Roundtable to U.S. Grant III. The award was bestowed on General Grant by none other than John C. Pemberton, the grandson of the general who had surrendered to the first Ulysses S. Grant at Vicksburg. I mean, it isn't what a coincidence, all right? Speaking at that event, um, was the Secretary of the Army, a man named Wilbur Brooker, and he urged citizens against this Cold War backdrop. He urged citizens to emulate the valor of Civil War soldiers in order to counter the threat posed by the so-called communist conspiracy, which he defined as the most ominous challenge since the birth of the nation. So, invoking, you know, calling upon the memory of the Civil War, Brooker aligned himself with the Civil War generation of battlefield preservationists, who themselves, when they faced external enemies, like the Spanish-American War at the turn of the 20th century, or domestic problems, also called up the memory of the Civil War to inspire patriotism and to promote social order, which was exactly what this individual, uh, Mr. Brooker, was doing. Then, a very interesting explanation in a yearbook, a pre-centennial yearbook of the Atlantic, Civil War Roundtable um, called Why Georgia Should Celebrate, Commemorate the Civil War, uh, emphasized as well the value of the war generation's example. The yearbook said, and I won't quote at length, but um, it's worthwhile, just a little bit of it. The greatness displayed by our forefathers a century ago certainly is a precious heritage. Their strength is our strength. Their example is our example, and their standard. God-fearing, devoted, patriotic, brave, statesmanlike, and enduring um, is our standard. You almost expect to hear apple pie and motherhood in there as well. There's a point to all of this, all right? Here's the deal. This particular statement emphasized American virtues. It's also a statement that very conveniently avoided issues like slavery and race relations. So something like this, a statement like this, did help citizens come together in remembering the Civil War while also allowing Southerners to feel good about a war that they lost. Um, as the commemoration unfolded, though, the ideal of promoting national unity certainly endured, but persistent racial prejudice and the discord that it generated really were substantial stumbling blocks in the way of um, a, a peaceful and harmonious commemoration for four long years. Um, at any rate, the Centennial's opening ceremony on the 8th of January in 1961 did reflect the interest that the National Commission had um, in appealing to a broad audience and certainly in advancing the theme of reunion and unity. Impartiality was the order of the day for simultaneous um, ceremonies that were held at Grant's tomb in New York City and Robert E. Lee's crypt which, if you've ever been there, you know is on the campus of Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia. Um, so, soldiers in full dress uniform, 
uh, honored both Union and Confederate dead during the New York observance, while U.S. Grant III, there he is again, praised General Lee as, and I'm quoting um, General Grant here, a great and knightly American soldier and citizen, unquote, in a telegram that was read to the people who were assembled at Lexington. <coughs> um, the resolute idealism, and certainly the conciliatory words and the rhetoric that you're hearing here of these simultaneous rituals in New York and in Lexington um, really kind of reflects a, a desire, a really strong desire um, to avoid contention, keep discussion, keep discourse on a very safe plane that officials on the national level really could not sustain indefinitely, much to their <coughs> chagrin. Um, and about three months later, about three months after this opening ceremony business in January, um, the Civil War Centennial Commission, the National Commission, in fact, was forced to deal publicly with the fact of a racially segregated society um, in a dispute that actually ended the leadership of both U.S. Grant III and Carl Betts. Uh, the controversy itself erupted where would you expect it to erupt? In Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, in the spring of in 1961, on the occasion of the Federal Commission's um, yearly so-called National Assembly. This National Assembly had started in the late 1950s. It was held once a year, was sponsored by the National Commission, and it was a gathering of participants from local commissions and state commissions and also civic groups. And it was held to you know, promote the centennial, give it some PR, and also so that they could discuss um, future programming and kind of share ideas. But when a politically prominent black woman named Madeline Williams, who was a member of the New Jersey um, State Centennial Commission, uh, charged that she was not able to secure accommodations at the headquarters hotel in Charleston. Protests from other New Jersey delegates as well as from the influential California and New York and Illinois and Wisconsin delegation, those commissions, immediately got wide media coverage, which resulted eventually in President Kennedy's intervention. He intervened and he moved the assembly out to the Charleston Naval Base, which of course was a desegregated federal facility. The fact that Kennedy intervened got all kinds of media attention um, with papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post leading the pack. Um, finally, in an interesting if unintended reenactment of sorts, um, Southern attendees of the National Assembly responded to the uproar and the moving of the whole thing out to the Charleston Naval Base by seceding from the opening ceremony at the base and meeting at the originally scheduled Francis Marion Hotel in Charleston, calling their function, and I'm quoting them here, the Confederate States Convention, unquote. You gotta love this stuff, you can't make it up. I mean, truth really is stranger than fiction. Um, there, uh, at their meeting, the, the, the um, Southerners heard a man named Ashley Halsey. Ashley Halsey was a Charleston-born journalist for the Saturday Evening Post. Um, I think some of most of us are probably familiar with the Saturday Evening Post. And he talked to the Southerners who were there, and in his address, he charged that northern states like New Jersey, remember he's Charleston-born, um, which he criticized as schizophrenic and discriminatory in its race relations, had no business criticizing fellow states for their racial policies or anything else for that matter. So things did not start out well. This, this commemoration did not start out auspiciously. Ultimately then, um, the April 1961 National Assembly stumbled, and it really did, to an uneasy conclusion. Its airing of the nation's dirty laundry really setting the tone and the stage for the commemoration that followed. Um, what happened to Carl Betts and to General Grant? Um, well, in terms of fallout, Carl Betts was fired. Uh, by the majority of his bosses on the National Commission within about five months of the public relations disaster there at Charleston that he had failed to avoid. Um, as for General Grant, uh, who was steadfastly loyal to Carl Betts, they were close friends and um, politically they were of one mind, General Grant resigned immediately when he really could not save um, his friend and ally and colleague Carl Betts. Uh, replacing Betts and Grant on the National Commission were two very interesting men, both of them scholars, acknowledged scholars. Replacing um, 
Mr. Betts was Virginian James Robertson. I think all of you probably are familiar with Bud Robertson and his books. Um, he was a much younger man, you know, gray hair, I've seen pictures of him, and he was a scholar, a well-known scholar. He took Carl Betts's job as the executive director, and replacing General Grant was Columbia University's Alan Nevins, the author of that multi-volume, Man the War for the Union. Now, when he assumed his job, Alan Nevins um, gave a talk in which he kind of advanced his vision for the observance of the centennial. And he did, um, in that he offered kind of his statement about the, his goals for the centennial. Uh, he did repeat previous calls for honoring the well over 600,000 fallen Americans during the war. He also broke some important new ground when he urged that the sacrifices of black troops, virtually all of whom were federals, that those needed to be acknowledged as well, he said. Uh, but when he urged recognition, and I think this is a very interesting juxtaposition that he does here, so watch his words. When he urged recognition of white Southerners who died for what they believed a just cause, and white Northerners who died for what they held a sacred duty, kind of in juxtaposition with a similar admonition to honor Negroes who died for the achievement of freedom and human equality, basically, at least in my opinion, what he was doing was begging the question of racism. Um, so at the end of the day, his effort to deal with the Civil War thoughtfully, but also tactfully, while at the same time circumventing the troublesome matter of a very pivotal and powerful but unresolved issue, really epitomized the challenges and the problems and the issues of remembering a war that got rid of slavery but really didn't eliminate prejudice in American life. Um, observance of something like the Emancipation Proclamation, though, you really cannot dodge the issue of race or slavery when you're talking about the Emancipation Proclamation. So that particular event, I think, offers um, an interesting kind of microcosmic glimpse into, as I call it, the rhetoric, the words, and the reality um, of American race relations 100 years after the Civil War. Um, even the anticipation of this anniversary generated problems months before the actual date. How did that happen? Um, several Southern commissions balked and formed a separate, uh, what was called, Southern Conference of Centennial Commissions when Alan Nevins insisted that all 50 states, both Southern and Northern, recognize the significance of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, undeterred, Nevins forged ahead to plan the main commemorative event. Um, it was held, not too surprisingly, where do you think? They couldn't even do it today, at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Um, on the 22nd of September, 1962, which if you know about the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, it was pronounced um, by President Lincoln on September 22nd, 1862, which is just five days after the pivotal Battle of Antietam, done as in my favorite battle and favorite battlefield. Uh, the highlights of that event were a rendition of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, by gospel singer Mahalia Jackson. I don't know if any of you remember her. I remember her well. She was the granddaughter of a slave. Um, another high point of that commemoration at the Lincoln Memorial was a presentation of a draft of the Emancipation Proclamation to the Library of Congress by Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York, whom I also remember well. So I'm dating myself, hopefully. Some of you, you all remember him as well, too. Um, interestingly, until shortly before the ceremony, Alan Nevins also thought that he had a commitment from the White House to President Kennedy's delivery of the main address, but apparently concerned about negative political fallout from an appearance that might offend white Southerners, Kennedy ultimately refused the invitation. Illinois' own Adlai Stevenson, who then was ambassador, American ambassador to the United Nations, replaced the president who sent his brother Robert, uh, and a recording in which the president, JFK, admitted that vestiges of discrimination and segregation endured, but he also listed a lot of things about which to be encouraged. Um, and I'm quoting the president here in his recording. Progress in education, in employment, in the even-handed administration of justice, in access to the ballot, and in public and private life. 
Um, the keynote speaker, Adlai Stevenson, on the other hand, um, was not nearly as optimistic as the president. Here's what he said. He wondered out loud whether Americans who saw the Cold War struggle in terms of good and evil, perceiving their nation as the land of the free, and their adversaries as pitch black really deserved the title, pure souled defenders of freedom, as long as many black Americans still were denied um, equal opportunity, access to equal opportunity, and especially still were denied the vote. Um, at any rate, while the Federal Centennial Commission took care of commemorations of general importance, like the Emancipation Proclamation, for example, um, it also urged states and communities to plan and commemorate the chief events of their history during the great national crisis. Most states had commissions, very energetic commissions, that were similar in composition to the national body and that followed the national commission's recommendations to uh, promote the involvement of communities and organizations and individual people in discovering their Civil War history and their connection to the Civil War. Um, activities for school kids were big ones. The encouragement of grassroots searches for documents and artifacts, um, and the development and promotion of sites with Civil War connections. All of these were common features of state um, centennial programs and planning. Heritage tourism flourished during the early 60s as the public converged on war-related sites of local importance and especially converged on federal battlefield parks. Tapping into history for profit, the American travel and hospitality uh, industries jumped on the same bandwagon as other uh, enterprises that recognized a public relations bonanza uh, when they saw one. Certainly, the National Centennial Commission wanted to inspire patriotism through dignified and educational programs that avoided commercialism. On the other hand, business interests knew very well that highlighting uh, the misery and the violence and the bloodshed of war was not a very promising sales approach. Uh, so federal officials really kind of walked a minefield as they tried to deal with the war in a serious fashion and simultaneously offend nobody. Uh, but business and industries usually took a much simpler approach and simply pretty much avoided substance altogether. Uh, like the distributing company that introduced a new bourbon called Johnny Reb with salesmen wearing Confederate uniforms. American enterprises resorted to the kind of promotional gimmicks that the National Commission really wanted to avoid, uh, but over it had, had little, if any, real control. It was really out of their hands. Uh, battlefields that Americans visited, and they visited them in record numbers. I've got just numbers for Gettysburg and Antietam, and it spiked um, in the 1960s, as you might well imagine. Battlefields that Americans visited in record numbers were scenes of rituals that really featured kind of the same mix of commercialism and idealism that characterized memorial ventures in other areas of American life. Um, observances that were held in battlefield venues, typically you would have monument dedications, um, there, those were legion. You would also have lots of politicians using the occasion to evoke um, their own vision of what the Civil War meant. But the activity that generated the most intense interest on a grassroots level was battle reenactment, um, which emerged actually in its modern form during the 1950s to become a popular commemorative and interpretive medium uh, during the centennial period and certainly, as we all know, way beyond that. Now, reenacted battles usually ended with pretend enemies kind of striking a conciliatory pose. Uh, but reenacting did generate its own share of opposition and controversy during the 60s. The national member of the National Commission, Bruce Catton, who really got me introduced, maybe as he did some of you, to loving narrative history and really being interested in the Civil War, he was a member of the National Commission. Um, he expressed the troubling side of reenacting for himself and a lot of other people when he asked rhetorically of a Richmond audience, and I'm quoting Mr. Catton, is it proposed to reenact the burning of cities, the march to the sea, uh, the appalling bloodshed of this most sanguinary conflict, unquote. Neither U.S. Grant III nor his successor, Alan Nevins, particularly favored the practice of reenacting. Nevins stating flatly that if the National Commission tries to reenact a, a, a battle, my dead body will be the first one they find on the field. So clearly Mr. Nevins did not approve of reenacting. 
Uh, for his part, as I said, General Grant was not comfortable with reenacting in the abstract, but he did concede that reenacting did spark young people's interest in history, it really sparks all kinds of people's interest in history. Uh, so for that reason, maybe, his name, General Grant's name, appeared on the letterhead of the so-called First Manassas Corporation, which was the organizer of the first major reenactment of the centennial. Now, the National Commission was not involved in formally sponsoring um, this reenactment at Manassas, but it cooperated with the planners, and so it did become identified with the July 1961 simulation of the Battle of First Bull Run. Uh, National Guardsmen and also members of reenactment groups presented phases of that contest um, for three days, for over three days, for over 70,000 spectators who paid $4 for grandstand seating, $2.50 for the rental of a folding chair, or stood at no charge. Um, and even though the spectacle culminated with Federals and Confederates coming together to sing God Bless America, um, that surface harmony really belied kind of a problem-filled event. For example, heat exhaustion, injuries from bayonetics and other accidents that occurred in the midst of battle felled a number of soldiers. But a more fundamental issue emerged with the observation of one participant who later, after the fact, was quoted as saying that many on both sides appeared intent on refighting the Civil War, and he noted his own fear that some drunken hothead would decide to really let fly with a mini ball during the reenactment. This is a quote that I read in a very interesting book about the history of reenacting and the, the re and reenacting during the centennial. Then in the aftermath of this entire event, uh, media condemnation was fairly widespread about the way it had been carried out. And that reinforced reservations about further involvement in these kinds of undertakings on the part of both the Civil War Centennial Commission and also on the part of the National Park Service, which actually had allowed the mock battle to be held inside the boundaries of Manassas National Battlefield Park in Northern Virginia. Um, also, the fact that some injured reenactors actually tried to sue the National Park Service. Try to do that now, they don't have any money, so I'm afraid we're going to get nowhere. But some injured reenactors actually did try to sue the National Park Service for the failure to take safety precautions no doubt also contributed to the Park Service's misgivings about holding similar events on federal property. <laughs> Finally, um, the criticism, and it was fairly widespread, that reenactments trivialized the loss of human life and the basic tragedy of war eventually came together with issues of resource protection and so persuaded the Park Service to institute its current policy that prohibits battle simulations inside of federal parks. Um, then, in their final report to Congress, federal commissioners summarized pretty well, I think, kind of the boundaries of contention over reenacting as a commemorative and educational medium. You, you sort of get the upside and the downside. And here's what they had to say, and it's a pretty decent summary. Defenders asserted that reenactments provided realism and color and pageantry that they enabled a lot of people to take a direct part in the centennial, and that they brought authentic sights and sounds of the Civil War to even greater numbers of people. The opponents, on the other hand, deplored the intrusions of commercialism and a carnival atmosphere, which they stated were an affront to good taste and an abuse to history. And my favorite line is the last line, a masterpiece of understatement. The debate over this question never was resolved, and it, it really never was. Uh, so at the end of the day, the problem is the following. Sponsorship of reenactments in most cases belong to state commissions. Local committees or private organizations really were the ones who supervised the planning and the execution of the numerous such events that mark the anniversary. So here's the bottom line. The United States Civil War Centennial Commission actually distanced itself from the practice of reenacting, but it had no authority to prevent sham battles, which enjoyed a lot of popular support throughout the course of the centennial. Maybe the most ironic thing about all of this reenactment business is the fact that commission members who collectively 
emphasized military valor and physical courage um, as major centennial themes individually, um, as we heard with Bruce Patton, for example, and Alan Evans, individually they were among the most outspoken critics of reenacting. So national officials found themselves in a situation to which they actually kind of contributed, if not one of their own making, um, when they promoted American bravery under fire as a principal theme. Um, as far as participants and their goals, Reenacting did a lot of different things. It enabled some people to memorialize what they found most meaningful about the Civil War. Um, it enabled others to reconstruct the image of the Civil War that they found most appealing or most comforting. The practice also allowed people who were so inclined to avoid painful truths and lose themselves in the theatrics of it all. Um, and along those lines, recreating kind of the visceral uh, experience of combat on the one hand facilitated avoiding such visceral issues as slavery and race and the definition of disloyalty, while at the same time they focused the attention of the reenactors themselves and spectators on shared virtues, things like physical courage and commitment to principle and devotion to duty, of which everybody could be proud. In a very real way, kind of the heroic and inspirational past that mainstream America was looking for from the centennial did come to life as reenacting really did capture the popular imagination. Um, but at the same time, there were other voices coming out of the centennial observance, and they revealed other ways in which Americans used their Civil War past um, to serve the present against the backdrop of the Civil Rights Movement. People like Adlai Stevenson, who took the podium on occasions like the 1962 commemoration of the Centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation, they reminded white Americans about the war's unfinished business uh, and urged them to live up to ideals of equality and justice. Then, the summer following that, the summer of 1963, with civil rights demonstrations and racial violence sweeping the South, Governor George Wallace of Alabama invoked a very different memory of the Civil War when he addressed people gathered in July 1963 um, at in Gettysburg to dedicate South Carolina's new state monument. Um, just one month, this must have had this happened in June 63, just one month after Governor Wallace's bid to obstruct the admission of black students to the University of Alabama aborted under federal pressure, federal court order, Governor Wallace exploited his appearance uh, at Gettysburg to vindicate his own resistance and the resistance of other southern states to federal desegregation efforts. He, so he informed Americans, and I got this right straight out of Newsweek. There was an article, Newsweek, uh, July 1963. Governor Wallace informed Americans that, and I quote Governor Wallace, South Carolina and Alabama stand for constitutional government, and thousands of people throughout the nation look to the South to restore constitutional rights uh, and the rights of states and of individuals. Um, finally then, with the centennial coming to a close, uh, Vice President Hubert Humphrey, I remember him too, um, spoke during ceremonies at Bennett Place near Durham, North Carolina. There, Joseph Johnston and, and a decimated Confederate army of 15,000 men had surrendered to fellow Buckeye William T. Sherman two weeks after Appomattox, thus bringing an end to fighting east of the Mississippi. In a year, 1965, first boots on the ground, at least first Marines on the ground in Vietnam, for example, in March 65. This is in April 65. So in a year that saw escalating American entanglements elsewhere in the world, intensified racial turmoil at home, Humphrey asked listeners for restraint, equating what he called the radicalism of reconstruction with a senseless, revengeful extremism that even today, if left unchecked, could bring our great democracy to its knees. So at a time when an interpretation of Reconstruction called the Dunning Interpretation, which is basically the gone with the wind school of uh, Reconstruction historiography, you know, prostrate South at the mercy of vengeful carpetbaggers and ignorant, their ignorant darky companions. Um, at a time when that gone with the wind school of Reconstruction historiography was really undergoing thorough revision, 
Vice President Humphrey still used that image of the Reconstruction era and of the Civil War in order to appeal to a Southern audience. And so really to promote the solidarity that was absolutely essential as the United States confronted serious problems both here at home and also abroad. Um, this was not a surprising finish to uh, what one commentator has called, a uh, very interesting phrase, one of the oddest, most prolonged, and often strained commemorations in American memory. So, the 1950s did see citizens increasingly worried about dangers to freedom and national security in a post-war world that seemed disconnected from situations and experiences that they were familiar with. Those kinds of concerns then moved Americans to embark on a quest for an epic past, a reassuring past, above all, a past that they recognized. And it was a past that they hoped to find with the centennial of the Civil War approaching. As the anniversary ran its course, however, the difficulties that really were inherent in remembering a war that validated nationhood and abolished slavery but left racism intact uh, surfaced again and again. So the reality of racial discrimination and the dissension that reality generated were genuine barriers to the unity of purpose and the civic harmony that was what anniversary planners at the federal level were looking for. It's what the United States Centennial Commission wanted to find. So the commemoration of 61 to 65 illustrated very well, I think, Americans, let's call them diverse centennial perceptions of the Civil War, and testified to what I would call the historical amnesia still prevalent in some quarters after 100 years of remembering. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you. So thank you for, thank you for your attention. I do appreciate it. And um, I, I, was a, I was a kid in high school and more worried about did I have a date, which I usually didn't on Saturday night. And I, I truly was not paying much attention to any of this stuff. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you were more aware of it. I really, not, not, certainly not to the Civil War Centennial. I just really was not aware. I mean, I was taking some history, and that was fine, but that was about it. So um, if there are any questions or any comments, I'd certainly welcome those. Um, or I'll sit down and get yeah, one. I mean, I, I, was, uh, I was 10 years old when that happened, and I honestly <coughs> can't remember <laughs> anything about the Centennial Commission. Or, all I know is that Life Magazine came out with a series. They did? They and, did. And it was wonderful. <coughs> I remember they, that uh, the American Heritage History of the Civil War. That's my favorite. Then you can go to you can go to Haley's People's Store or and you can buy a Civil War cap and a Civil War cap gun. I remember that. And they had Johnny, uh, was it Johnny Shiloh mm -hmm. with the Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. uh, I know. remember all that. I remember yeah. Johnny from being the revolutionary and was, kid. Uh, and that, that was, and that was what I remember, you know, and I don't. You're doing better than I am. The other things that, you know, that you're, you know, that, that they were probably very true, but um, the one thing that bothers me today is our 150th. Nothing much has happened. Nothing much has happened, and I, and I wonder. Well, this has something to do with it. Oh, on the national level, nothing is happening um, for a variety of reasons that we're probably all very much aware of. But I think the, the this, Civil this War problem. is probably more popular today than it was in the 1960s. I mean, uh, it's, it's I mean, well, maybe it's because the people who are alive at that time are the ones that are pushing it. I mean, it's more popular amongst the baby boomers. Well, and I'm a baby boomer, and I yeah. think we're all here, we're all baby boomers, and so I'm paying attention to it now, but it's yeah. fascinating now. But we had other things on our minds back then. My mom took us to get, you know, my mom dragged us to Gettysburg. I was probably 12, so that was, it was in the late 50s. It wasn't even the centennial yet, but that's the very first trip I ever took to a battlefield was to Gettysburg, probably similar to all of you. Yeah, Dave. Just for the record, I was three years old then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was dating on Saturday oh, night. You know. <laughs> yeah, I had a date. Yeah, you had a date. But anyway, probably did. as you were talking, I was thinking about the awful similarities of the political climate and the, the headbutting that was going on in your descriptions, so reminiscent of what's going on today. Have we learned nothing some in 50 things, years some things never about changed. getting along with one another and you know, maybe the fact that we call the, uh, the Civil War a seminal event 
is even more true after hearing the comparison of then and now that it was either a rock or a ship of state broke on or it, well, it certainly didn't heal us. It didn't. I, I, I'm sort of a cockeyed optimist. I, I think that if we can survive that war, I, I, I think we can survive a lot. I really do. Certainly, hopefully what's going on in D.C. now. I, I hope the people are better than their leaders. The soldiers in the Army of the Potomac were a heck of a lot better than their leaders. So I, I, and I don't mean to be uh, flippant. I, I really do hope that people are better. People will get it together and um, take care of business. But this, this is a real eye-opener. I this, just doing this research was a real eye opener for me because it really wasn't paying much. I mean, I didn't have a historical consciousness then. I'm for it more and more is a pity. Yes, sir. In light of uh, your research and what you did, were you surprised when government, uh, Governor McDonald of Virginia made the comments he did at the opening of the uh, centennial, uh, the Sesame Centennial, saying it was going to be Confederate History Month, but he forgot about the African Americans and all of that? You know what? Not a very smart politician. Somebody didn't give him very good advice. He, he, I, I don't think I'm all that surprised. Were you? No, I think his naivete was that he thought it was still 1961. I, I, just, I think, I think there are other people who did have it on their minds. Um, it's unfortunate that he didn't. And you're right. He was living in the past, and it would also. This, it just, it, something, the way, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I think that the fear, that the reason that there's not more on the national level, there's southern, some southern states are doing a lot. My own state of Illinois has no money. Um, that will even get into that one. And so there's, there's not going to be any observance. I don't know what they've done in Wisconsin. I know some, I know very different states, it's been very, it's been very, Disparate the way they're doing it. I don't think I was that surprised. I cringed when I read what what he when what Governor McDonald said because there are Virginians. There's a terrific museum called the Tredegar Museum in, in Richmond mm -hmm. um, that was started by a, a man named Alexander Wise, who is like the great grandson of the War Governor of Virginia, a Southerner born and bred, and it has and it commemorates a black memory, um, a white Northern memory, and a white Southern memory of the Civil War. So it's there if you want to see it, but. I, Still, when there's still issues about the Confederate battle flag and you know and that sort of thing, I'm not surprised that this crops up even by a politician who ought to know better. That you don't seem all that. You said you weren't all that surprised either. You know the interesting thing though was that in 1961 the blowback was rather soft and quiet. In 19, and sorry, 2011, uh, African Americans, women. All sorts of groups that had not been represented in the 100th anniversary all of a sudden made the presence known. They'd always been there, but now they're making the presence known, and they had to kind of rethink what they were going to approach well, in the situation. Well, and that, and that was, you know, and, and the Civil Rights Revolution was accompanied by the Women's Revolution, by the Women's Rights Revolution, and all of those. And they started writing history, they called it history from the bottom, kind of history from the bottom up instead of history from the top down. Um, my my, my beef with any kind of hyphenated history is that you lose sight of the synthesis that, 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 that we're all doing this together. It's like trying to separate out military history from the Civil War, and I've had academic historians who've taught me who wanted to do that. They want to talk about the social history, or the political history, or the diplomatic history, the economic history of the war, but it was a war. So you have to talk about battles as well. But I don't think you can separate anything out, and you can't understand the Civil War if you don't talk about it society and politics and economics or battles. And so I like synthesis. I think James McPherson is good at pulling things together. There are a few other authors that do the same thing. Um, but things have changed since then. I, I, I do hope that they don't kind of throw the baby out with the bath, bath water and avoid military history altogether. I take issue with that. And academic historians are, are, are past masters at it. Because I've had academic historians and I, one who totally avoided the war, talked about abolitionists and reconstruction. I learned a lot about both, but he didn't want to talk about the war. Uh, on the other hand, military history doesn't mean anything if you don't have the rest of it. So I think your point's well taken. They all fit, but they've all got to fit. But um, 
it, it's unfortunate that not much is going on these days. I think Americans, uh, and I think that now that, what is it, 60, it's 13 in two years, it will be on the wane again, I think. I think it's been a boon for preservation, and I'm a battlefield preservationist, but it has been a boon, not just for the Civil War Trust, but for Shaft, Save the Historic Antietam and Foundation, and other groups, because people are aware they're visiting battlefields more, they're taking their kids to battlefields. The Park Service, when they can operate, do a terrific job of educating Americans and interpreting battlefields and running all kinds of great programs. And they can't do battle reenactments in federal parks, but they can do <coughs> artillery firings and they can do encampments, so they can do the living history that really gets people involved. They just can't do battle simulations where they take shots at other human beings. So it's a, it's a real shame that, you know, here we are in the middle of a great opportunity and it's getting lost, although people appear to be finding their way beyond that. I don't like the position the Park Service is put in. I, I like the National Park Service and I think they find themselves kind of in the middle. I didn't mean to get into this, but they find themselves in the middle of a real tough situation and I think that's unfortunate. We were, we were at Gettysburg for the 150th and I it thought was the huge. Parks, it was huge. They and what group. was really gratifying was seeing all the families there. So people wanted Brought their this. kids. They wanted right. desperately. People wanted desperately. They do. And the Park Service did a great job. They you know? I mean, it was hot, and they were out there with water at every stop, and you know, and good programming around, sure. and great programming. But it was just, I mean, it was really um, encouraging to see that there was, you know, the public just turned out for it. And they, you know, these big band rooms full of kids, and you know, they just soaked up every minute of it. They, they do a great job, they really do. And I think that um, in terms of, I mean, they interpret the battlefields themselves, but also, getting back to what you were saying about the war itself, um, because of the way that, because of changes in historiography and understanding the Civil War, and that you can't deny that race and slavery had something to do with it. The Park Service itself has taken a lot of heat from some people. Um, has been much more inclusive about including um, issues about cause and effect. Why were all of these soldiers killing each other on these battlefields in the first place? And what was it all about? And why were soldiers there? And it, there have been some wonderful books written. Jim McPherson has, I mean, there's a whole genre of books about why were the soldiers fighting? And they've looked at their letters and their diaries, and they've talked about everything from Union to my buddies were going, um, to you will find abolitionists, or I was fighting my own great grandfather en enlisted twice in the Union Army from Ohio, but I don't know why he enlisted. I give my IT to have a diary or a letter that said, was he an abolitionist? Was he doing it because other young men in his community did it? Um, what did he think of race? What did he think of slaves and slavery and blacks? I have no idea, but the Park Service has inter is interpreting those, at I mean, in the New Gettysburg Museum mm -hmm. and in the films that they're making, and they've gotten, they've taken heat from the old Confederates, um, from people who don't think that they should be doing that, that the battlefields are there just to discuss the battle. Well, the question is, why were, why did, why were there 23,000 casualties at Antietam in nine hours? What were they there for? You, you have to, you, it has to be broader than that. The reason they never did it in the first place because it was the first, and that there's a good reason for that. The first generation that established these battlefields was the war generation. And I made reference to them that they couldn't have established battlefield parks in the 1890s if they hadn't gotten Southern support. The South lost the war. They weren't gonna get Southern support unless, and, and Southerners were in Congress and they were wealthy too. They needed a consensus. So what did they do? They said, these are battlefield parks. We're not gonna talk about politics. They were all brave Americans. They were all fighting for principle. Um, slavery's over, but a great United States is here. We can all agree on the results. So they got money, they got federal money, and they got Southern support, because without Southern support, they would never have been able to set aside thousands of acres to establish the parks. The people of mid-century were trying to do the same thing. They were trying to find a consensus. It was much tougher then, because of the Civil Rights America, because the United States had changed in 100 years, although they, they didn't want to talk about it. I hope that that sort of, that's also includes sort of some of what, what you were making a point about. And thanks for your attention, I do appreciate, yes sir. I would think that uh, the Kennedy assassination had something to do on the centennial, maybe with cutting it. 
You know, I've, I've wondered that myself a bit. There it is in November. I mean, 63, uh, George Wallace speaking at Gettysburg, I quoted him. Two months after he spoke, there was the bombing of that black church in Birmingham, Alabama, where those four little girls were killed. And then two months after that, Kennedy himself was assassinated. And I remember thinking, I wonder what that did to the centennial. I, I really don't know, and I'm sorry that I, that I can't. Um, offer you anything on that, but it's it's sure well it's well worth it's well worth looking into. And it, you know what? I haven't I didn't think about this, but this is if you're interested in this book, I recommended it, and Donna is reading it. It's called I didn't have access to this. I researched this for my dissertation, and it was before this book was out. Um, but this book did help me revise this a little bit with some good information on that mess at the at the opening ceremony in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, it's called Troubled Commemoration by Robert Cook, and it's, um, it's very readable. It has some good stuff on some of the, the history that was being written then, if you're interested in how um, the civil rights movement was impacting the writing of Civil War history, it really, it certainly was. Mm -hmm. so, it's a, so I highly recommend it. I'm reading some of it myself, and I started at the back, so I'm reading the back first, and the, the end of it, and then I'll dabble on the rest of it. So just I, to, yeah, just to comment on the book, yeah. too, um, after Mary suggested it, I have it on my Kindle, and it's like probably one of those you really don't want to get on an electronic reader because it's just too hard to go up and back rather than page by page. But uh, where Mary started at the end, I'm starting at the beginning of the book, and I'm actually in chapter two on the book now. And it is, it, it, it is truly very highly readable. Um, and there's just so much going on in the book. And, and I was reading it on my lunch break at the bank the other day, and I'm reading and like, oh, Oh, listen to this, listen to this, this girl sitting in just listen, let me just read this to you. Just, just let me read this to you. And it's just, you just want to shake your head. And the fact that this centennial, you know, as I'm reading too, of course, is going on during the Cold War, and the politicians wanted to also try and unify the country well, sure. in their fight towards communism. We are the good, they are the bad, and we want that whole American attitude um, and you know what they did? They wanted to totally ignore the Emancipation Proclamation or yeah. anything that showed any divisiveness because they wanted the Southern element to meld with the Northern element and bring the country and show the country in one unified sphere. So let's not do anything like that. No, 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 that's not, and I mean, one of the comments in there was about how, how the blacks were so happy in their southern life, and I'm, that's what I was reading at lunch, some of this, some of this, you know. So by all means, pick up the book, I'll put the exact title and author on um, um, an email to you guys. It really, really accentuates Mary's talk, and it'll give you some, some more food for thought. I just yeah. have, a, I have a point. Now sure, you're, you're please, talking, you're please. Talking, you're talking about you know, African Americans, you know, uh, have, has that community, and I don't know, I'm not just thinking out of top of my head, have they embraced Civil War history? Or is it a part of history that's so painful to them they don't want to get involved with it? You know what, I just know anecdotal stuff. Does any, can anybody else speak to that? Yes, yes, ma'am. I can a little bit. I am. Um, one of my customers, my office has got a wide variety of things in it, and part of it was my Civil War books on my shelf. And he mm -hmm. came in and sat and talked to me, oh, the Civil War, I love reading, and we were back and forth and very into it and asking questions. He says, I never got to dig into it a lot. And I said, well, I got into it, you know, here at Carroll College through checking my ancestors out. I said, did you have anyone in your family fight in the war? And he just said, Mary, he says, I can't tell my family history much past my grandfather because there aren't any records. So for him, it was hard to take a personal view of the war since their history is so muddled, their family history. I could go back and say, hey, my great grandfather fought in this regiment and he was at these battles and so I had a big contact connection with that. He couldn't do that saying, he says, yeah, our family they just took the names of the slaveholders, a lot of them, or they changed names totally because they want to be known. So he says it's really hard to do a family tree to even get into where they were. So he says it's, he says we, and of course this was a number of years ago before some of the more modern ways of tracing family trees have come about, but that was a big roadblock for him. He wanted to know more about the war. He knew his ancestors, some of them did come from the south, but beyond that he didn't know much and he couldn't track names very well. 
So I think in some ways that's hard for them to do that unless you had three black ancestors that you could follow your family tree in. I know that the movie Glory, and you know, there's a 54-3 reenactment group, and, and they were involved in the making of the film. That sort of thing um, has generated a lot of interest, and Ken Burns' thing did. But in my personal experience, um, members in the Civil War Trust or members in my own Chicago Civil War Roundtable, there, there really are not, there are maybe a, a handful of black members. So uh, that, that's, all, that's all I know. I, I don't think. Um, that they've embraced it. I wish I knew, could, the Tredegar, um, the, the, you know, the Tredegar Ironworks used to be owned by, I think it was Aon, and they have, they worked out a deal with the city, or it's, it's a private museum. I don't know if you're familiar with the Tredegar Museum in Richmond, but they've done a wonderful job of presenting what they have seen, I've seen it, they've done a wonderful job of presenting this history. I don't know what the black community in Richmond has done in terms of embracing this thing. Um, I wish I knew more about that, but to the best of my knowledge, no, it's just, it, it, it's not happened. Well, to me, I would seem like, okay, let's say that, you know, my nationality, I mean, if, if they were picking on Polish people, I mean, <laughs> if, I mean if, if I was alive in Europe in 1915 and I, my country was occupied by Russians and then they were slaughtering my people, and then uh, somebody kept to me, you know, you know, your people were slaughtered by the Russians and you, know, you guys were slaves and serfs, you know, and then people like, yeah, you know. And the next guy comes up, you know, I just read about you serfs and your slaves. <laughs> you know, and you're going like, yeah, it, you it know. I, I mean, it's like somebody, like somebody taught, we well, hates to go to the dentist, and they keep bringing, I just had my tooth filled there, and I got, you know, and their people are going like, yeah, okay, we know we were slaves, we know where we came from, you know. Please, just let it be. Yeah. Please, yeah. you know. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, it's, I, don't, it's, I, I don't think it's all that hard to figure out. Well, we just, we just came back from the, um, what was it, the 16th? Oh, Civil Wars War Symposium yeah. at Cantini. At Cantini. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And what, and two of the topics dealt with, in one way, shape, or form, slavery. Oh, there were and, a lot of, a lot of there were, there were lot of, yeah. many I think there's been a lot more academic work. Now. Yes. Yeah, yes. Academic. As far as, you know. Yeah. The, the, as far as grassroots stuff. Right, yeah. right. So much. And I know even in the reenacting world, there are very, you know, there's 54th Massachusetts. I mean, the famous there ones. There's the 29th U.S. Colored Group here in Wisconsin. So there are some, but, you know, by and large, there's very few, you know, nobody wants to reenact being a slave. A, a slave. <laughs> you know, they, they do, I, they do, at, at, you know, at Colonial Williamsburg, uh, they, if I think it was controversial, I don't know if it is anymore, they have slave quarters, and they have uh, African Americans reenacting being slaves there in Williamsburg. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's it's well received, and they're they're doing something to educate. And um, it's powerful. And it's yeah. well, of course, yeah. How could it not be powerful? And I, you know, I think what we all do, and I'm as guilty, I'm guilty of it, is we look at the past with present eyes. I mean, I read this and I'm I'm disappointed and I and I don't like it. But you know what? I, I that was then. Mm -hmm. This is now. And you have to you don't have to approve of it, but you have to take them for who they are, and and let it and, and let the time, it be. And the at the time, time at the, you have to look at the, at the at the time and mm -hmm. and um, respect it and appreciate it for what it is. You don't have to approve it. You don't have to agree with it. But it is what it is. And you know, we acknowledge it and maybe learn from it, although I'm not so sure anybody's really optimistic about that. Except me. I think I'm a cockeyed optimist. Yeah. They'll figure it out. You know? <laughs> well, I so think you have half empty or half full. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the thing. Yeah, we got lemon make lemonade. There you go. I have to it all night. I'm going to shut up. So yeah. thanks very much for uh, yeah. thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for showing up tonight. And make sure you show up again next month. I wanted to thank